So uh, I mentioned this briefly, I think at the end of class on Monday. So I'm gonna draw a picture to try to illustrate what's happening better because it'll be a little better than me just trying to explain things. So we have silicon dioxide layer, SiO2 insulator, sitting on top of a well-ordered single crystalline lattice structure, right? And we're speaking here particularly in the channel of our transistor. So hopefully um, in either your 334 class or potentially your even freshman chemistry classes or something like that, you all learned how silicon crystals are bonded together. It's just covalent bonds, right? So silicon has four electrons in the valence band. So that means that it's a double covalent bond with all of the neighbors and all that kind of good stuff. Crystal too big, so I have to fill in too many bonds. Give me a second. And generally speaking, how many of you are familiar with energy band diagrams? <laughs> okay, draw one and you'll tell me. All right, so for crystal, uh, for single crystal silicon, um, this is the energy band associated with the valence band, and this is the energy band associated with the conduction band, and there is, I believe it is a energy band gap, EG, of 1.12 electron volts, I believe. So what that means is that in the regular crystalline silicon, if we have an electron in the valence band to get it up into the conduction band requires it to gain an energy of 1.12 electron volts. So it has to gain enough energy to cross that gap, that band gap, right? Well, in or at the interface where between the substrate area and that oxide, we have dangling bonds because they're not full of electrons, right? And so what these dangling bonds do they give alternative energy states that are low, right? So effectively, an electron can gain a small amount of energy and get trapped here in one of these intermediate states before it gets enough energy to move into the conduction band, okay? This random trapping and releasing of electrons that occurs in the channel due to these extra energy states that are caused by the dangling bonds causes flicker noise, right? So it's not a constant source of noise. Every time an electron gets trapped, there's one that's moved away. So that's lowering your signal a little bit. And then when it gets pushed up, it gets sent back in. So it's like little pulses of noise, which is why it's called flicker noise, okay? 
Um, <clears throat> the noise voltage spectral density Vn one over F squared. Sorry, I didn't mean to put that bar right there. For flicker noise is K multiplied by C ox W times L times F, the frequency. Okay, where K is a process dependent parameter, usually on the order of 10 to the negative 25 volt squared farads. So this noise is very often called one over F noise because the spectral density is inversely proportional to the frequency, right? So at very low frequencies, we have a lot of noise power. And at very high frequencies, this trails off. Because at high frequencies, things move in and out much quicker. And so it starts to look a little bit more like regular white noise kind of thing, all right? Um, as a quick aside, we can model this noise voltage spectral density as a noise current spectral density, I n one over F squared by simply multiplying our voltage by the transconductance squared, right? So the transconductance converts that voltage into a current and then we square it because we're we have a voltage squared that's being converted into current squared so that's just going to look like k gm squared divided by c ox wl times f okay so it should be fairly obvious here but our one over F noise is reduced by increasing the size of our transistors, right? Because as the area, the width and the length of the channel gets larger, the noise goes down. So for ultra low noise amplifiers, it's pretty regular to have transistors with an area of thousands of square microns. So effectively transistors almost on the size of a discrete transistor size even though they're an integrated transistor, just to minimize that one over F noise, because at very low frequency applications, it becomes so dominant, you have to figure out how to get rid of it, okay? So, Let's do a very quick little example problem here. Thermal noise and one over F noise for a current source, right? So we're just utilizing the transistor as a current source. So um, we want to determine the total thermal noise and total one over F noise or a frequency band ranging from one kilohertz to 
1.21 megahertz. All right. So our thermal noise, INTH squared, we know should be 4 ABT gamma DM from our last class meeting. And so our total thermal noise then, right? So effectively what we're gonna be doing, this guy has units of amp squared hertz, right? So if we were to multiply this spectral density, which is a white spectral density, by the bandwidth that we're interested in, we're going to wind up getting the total noise in that bandwidth, right? We're effectively just integrating this constant value from one kilohertz to one megahertz. So our thermal noise would be four KET gamma GM times 10 to the six minus 10 to the three hertz, which is going to approximately be four ABT gamma GM times 10 to the six and our units here wind up just being amp squared, right? Nothing, hopefully nothing too wild or crazy there. We're simply multiplying the noise spectral density by the bandwidth to get the total noise that we see. Everybody okay with that? For our one over F noise, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult because we have a frequency dependency, right? So our one over F noise, is given by K dm squared divided by C ox WL. And I'm explicitly taking out that frequency term um, because to find the total noise, I'm gonna have to actually integrate this guy since it is frequency dependent. Sorry, I total one over F. K GM squared Yox W over L integral from one kilohertz to one megahertz. BF divided by F. <coughs> Excuse me which is going to be the same as AGM squared Eox WL natural log of 10 to the three or approximately 6.91 capital K Dm squared divided by C ox WL. So <clears throat> if we wanted to quantify the significance of one over F noise versus thermal noise, it might be useful to make a plot. All right. So let's say that this is 20 log dn squared, right? Our noise voltage. And on this axis, we have our frequency that is in the log scale. Our one over F noise is gonna look something like this. So it decays as frequency increases because 
the spectral density tells us that it goes down as the frequency goes up. Our thermal noise is going to be flat across the entire frequency spectrum. And our overall transistor noise then is going to be a combination of the two. So effectively, we add these guys together. And we get this purple line here. That matches the one over F noise at very low frequencies and then matches the thermal noise at very high frequencies. And we have what's called a corner frequency here, FC, that tells us which quantity is dominant, right? So for F less than FC, one over F noise, Dominates. Or F greater than FC, thermal noise dominates. And in the region of FC, obviously, the total noise is a contribution of both the thermal noise and the one over F noise. So our corner frequency is defined as where the contribution of the thermal noise and the contribution of the one over F noise are identical, right? So we could say that for KBT times gamma GM is equal to K GM squared over C ox WL multiplied by one over FC. And now we would have to solve for FC. And I realized that in my derivation earlier, I used two thirds for gamma instead of actually using gamma. So we're gonna have to do some math here to get a general thing. I apologize for making that mistake. Um, so, Looks like I can just multiply both sides by FC and then divide both sides by that four KBT business right there, and that'll take care of it. Um, so we should have FC is equal to K GM, not squared anymore, divided by four KBT gamma. W times L. Yep. Okay. Well, that derivation was easy enough. All right. All right. So we have now finished describing the different types of noises that we are going to see, right? Our circuits are going to be made up of resistors, transistors and capacitors. Capacitors don't exhibit any thermal noise. They just shape noise right? as part of filters and things like that. So they don't have any noise to contribute on their own. So we really only need to pay attention to the noise contributions of resistors and transistors. So Noise representation in is what we're going to talk about now. So we already know about our noise generating sources and all that kind of good stuff that we've used for a resistor, right? So 
Uh, we could either have a noise generator in series with the resistor, or we can have a noise generator in parallel with the resistor. Um, and typically speaking for a transistor, we wind up modeling the noise as a current source connected between the drain and the source, because that's where we see the noise, right? So the channel noise is a noise current literally flowing between the source and the drain. The one over F noise is also a noise current flowing, or we've, we've seen that we can model it as a noise current flowing between the source and the drain. And if we had any um, thermal noise due to say the resistance of a gate, we could refer that to a noise current between the source and the drain simply by multiplying that noise voltage at the gate by the square of the transconductance, right? Because that's going to convert that input noise voltage at the gate to a drain current, because that's what transistors do. Okay. So if we had a simple circuit like this, so let's deal with just a basic common source amplifier, RD. Is V out as a function of time. Here's V in as a function of time. If we wanted to perform a noise analysis on this particular, all we would need to do. as put our noise sources into the circuit in a way that makes it the easiest to analyze, right? So what I mean by that specifically, let's take this transistor RD. We know that it's tied to the drain node of our transistor, so we'll work on that in a second, but it'll wind up being easiest to analyze this if we consider the resistor's noise as a noise current spectral density in parallel, because when we look at our uh, transistor, we know that we're going to model that guy as a noise current spectral density as well. So this will be I N, and let's just call it M1 here where this is transistor M1. And because we are doing noise analysis, we would ground our input. And our goal would be to figure out what the noise voltage is Vn out squared here. The output noise voltage spectral density, okay? So are there any questions about how I set this guy up. Let's, let's start there. Anything seem wild or wacky? So let's talk about how we could approach determining what that noise spec output noise spectral density is. Okay. Is the transistor noise correlated with the resistor noise? Because this, this actually makes a difference in how we approach a problem. So what does correlation mean, right? Kind of caused by the same source and all that kind of stuff. So it stands to reason that transistor noise and the resistor noise should be completely uncorrelated because they're happening for completely different reasons and they're associated with completely different circuit elements, right? So because those two noises are uncorrelated, the total noise here is just gonna be the sum of those two quantities, right? So we can just add the powers. If they were correlated, what we would have to do is effectively use superposition to find what the noise current density is at the input and then use the transistor gain to send it to the output effectively. And we're going to do that in a little bit so that you'll have an illustration of both here. Okay. We could say in this case 
or we could let, let's look at a small signal model first actually i think that might be more helpful right so we have our gate which is shorted our voltage vgs there's our source terminal which is shorted We have our regular dependent current source, which converts that small signal gate voltage into an output current. We have our resistor R out between our source and drain. We have our resistor RD between our source and drain. And now we're gonna have some noise current, I N here, between our source and drain. Or a better way to say that explicitly would be between our drain and ground. Right. So effectively, since these two noises are uncorrelated and they're in parallel, we can add them together easily. Where I'm again playing fast and loose with the directions here because they're random signals. So even though these look to be in, so one is pointing from the drain to ground and the other one is pointing from AC ground, which is at BDD to the drain, I'm not going to say that they cancel each other out because I have no basis by which to make that assumption, right? So I'm going to add those two noise currents together. So this would be, oops. Our total noise current spectral density, right? And then here is that VN output noise voltage spectral density that we're trying to find. So in this case, since VGS is zero, I know that my dependent current source isn't going to contribute anything to the output. And so my output noise spectral density is just going to be Vn out squared is equal to In total squared times the resistance that that noise current sees, right? Which would just be R out in parallel with Rd. Because I'm dealing with power spectral densities squared, I need to square that resistance, right? So that voltage squared is equal to amp squared times resistance squared. And then that takes care of all my units and all that kind of good stuff. And just for the sake of argument here, then we could say that this guy is going to be four, KBT gamma GM plus KGM squared divided by C ox WL F plus four KBT divided by RD all multiplied R out in parallel with RD squared, where this portion right here represents the thermal noise of transistor M1. This guy right here represents the one over F noise of transistor M1, 
And this guy right here represents thermal noise of resistor RD, right? So I was able to just add all my contributing noise powers together to get I in total because they're uncorrelated. So we have some idea of what the output noise is. If we threw some numbers in here, we could make a calculation. Is that helpful? How? So <clears throat> the output noise isn't a particularly helpful quantity because it doesn't allow us to make a direct comparison, okay? And so what I mean by that is let's say that we took this amplifier, which has this amount of output noise, and then we connected it to a second stage of a pure noiseless amplifier what we would see is that our output noise goes up even though we're connecting another noiseless amplifier to it because that's what gain does is it just amplifies signal okay so our system seems even noisier even though we've added noiseless components seems counterintuitive but it's because we're thinking about it backwards right what we really need to be looking at is noise at the input because the noise at the input signal is going to tell us whether or not we are corrupting our actual input signal and whether we can get anything useful at the output to begin with, right? So effectively, since the input signal and the input referred noise signal both get amplified by the gain, that's a good place to make the comparison because it's a true apples to apples measure of what's called our signal to noise ratio where signal to noise ratio just for a quick introduction snr measured in db is defined to be 20 log the in over the end, right? Our input signal divided by our noise signal. And then we 20 log gives us our signal to noise ratio measured in decibels. Where in this case, an SNR of zero corresponds to the input signal and the noise signal have the same power um, and so forth, right? So if the, yeah, so zero is, the noise and the signal are perfectly matched. Positive signal to noise ratios are good. Negative to signal to noise ratios means that the noise is larger than the signal that we're trying to amplify or process or whatever, okay? So if we have a simple voltage amplifier circuit, And we can figure out what the output noise voltage is. We can refer that noise voltage to the input to draw our comparisons, where Vn in is simply Vn out divided by the voltage gain squared. Now, this next part that I'm gonna talk about here is a little bit tricky and awkward to understand, but it's actually critically important, okay? So we can refer any output noise signal as uh, to the input to generate an input noise signal as well. But we can actually refer an output noise voltage 
to be an input noise current, okay? And why that's important has to do with the impedance of our input source. So our true input source generator, right? Which could be a prior transistor stage or something like that, okay? So when we measured or when we did this noise determination here, we short out our input signal, right? So for a general black box system, what our current methodology says is that we have a noisy circuit. over which we measure some output noise spectral density. We can convert this to a noiseless circuit. where this input noise voltage V V N N, sorry, I'm putting too many eyes in it, is effectively responsible for generating the output noise spectral density here. So before I, I talk about this further and, and what I'm getting at, I wanna make something very, very clear here. The output noise spectral density of a system is something that we can actually go measure, right? We can go get a spectrum analyzer. So if we got a very low, if we took one of the op amps or something like that that we've been working with in the lab, and we took the output of that and connected it to a very low noise amplifier, and then connected the output of that amplifier to our spectrum analyzers that we have up in Dr. Chen's lab, we could literally see the output noise spectral density as a physical measurement that we had done, okay, as a function of frequency. The input referred noise spectral density is not a physical quantity that we can measure, okay? If we hooked up a spectrum analyzer to the input of a circuit, we would see nothing. It's all coming from the noise that's generated and being sent to the output because of the amplifier gain and all that kind of stuff, right? So this quantity here is a mathematical construct that helps us perform a comparison to our input signal levels to see what changes that we might need to make in our design, all right? Absolutely cannot measure it, okay? So I just wanna be real, real clear about that, okay? So in this case, the input resistance of our noisy circuit was zero, right? So if we tried to look in, Rn was zero ohms because we just had that short circuit there, right? We shorted directly to ground. Now, what if we had a circuit where we look in and Rn is infinite, the extreme opposite case, right? So we have an infinite input impedance that we have to worry about for our noisy circuit. We should still be able to figure out what our output noise is
But when we try to refer it to the input, we're going to have something that looks like this, right? So we have to maintain our source or input impedance. And so we would have Vn in connected like this. Here is our noiseless circuit. What would we see at our output? Okay, so let's think about this here because it's a weird and it's a subtle nuance, all right? So in this guy right here, it's fairly obvious that this noiseless circuit is an amplifier. We apply this noise voltage at the input, we get an amplified version of the noise at the output. But over here, because of our infinite input impedance, Effectively, we're not completing the circuit, right? So our input referred noise by itself would wind up generating exactly zero volts of noise at the output. So there's a problem with our model, okay? And so how we fix that is by using an input refer uh, referred noise current as well, okay? So our noise model should be this guy. I'm going to call this Zn Zn n squared. I n in squared. So we we need to include both the input referred noise voltage and the input referred noise current. This will work for any arbitrary impedance Z n ranging all the way from zero ohms to infinity ohms, right? So when Zn in is zero ohms, all the current flows through the short. None of it gets transferred to the output. When Zn in is infinitely large, none of the voltage gets transferred to the output, but all of the noise current generates that output noise voltage spectral density. Okay. So let's look at. The input referred noise of common source amplifier. So let's say that we have this guy. It's going to be very similar to what we just did. So if 
this is our circuit that we're going to analyze. Okay, our ultimate goal is to determine both the n in squared and in squared. So let's determine the input referred noise voltage first. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our circuit and we're going to find our output noise voltage because that's usually the easiest thing to do. So we know that our resistor will have noise current I N R D. Our transistor will have some noise current I N M1. We have our capacitor C in, and what we're trying to figure out here is what this V n in is. Here is our output noise voltage. All right, so. How do we find that output noise voltage, right? Anybody have any thoughts? How is this circuit any different from the one that we analyzed like 10 minutes ago? from the output side. It isn't. It should have the exact same output referred, referred noise voltage because it only has, so this, this is generating the noise from the resistor RD. This is representing the noise from the transistor M1. So we should know right from the jump effectively that Vn out is Four KBT gamma GM plus K GM squared over C ox WLF plus four KBT divided by RD. And just for the sake of argument to make the math slightly easier, although I think in this it doesn't particularly matter, let's ignore channel length modulation and just say that it's going to be multiplied by. Rd squared instead of R out in parallel with Rd. I'm, I'm literally doing it that because I'm running out of money. Okay, doesn't actually change our relationships in any way, shape, or form. Our input referred noise voltage, Vn in, is simply our measured output noise voltage divided by the voltage gain of this amplifier squared. So our numerator here will have four KBT gamma GM plus K GM squared divided by C ox WL F plus four KBT divided by RD times RD squared. What should our denominator be? What's the voltage gain 
of a common source amplifier where we're neglecting channel length modulation. Right. So when we square that guy, we get GM squared, RD squared down here. This guy cancels this guy. And so we wind up seeing that our input referred noise voltage is 4 kbt gamma over gm plus k over cox wlf plus 4 kbt over gm squared rd. So to be clear, what we did there, we found the output noise voltage and referred it to the input by dividing by the square of the amplifier's gain. Okay. Figuring out what the input referred noise voltage in, what noise voltage is, is pretty simple, right? If we can figure out what the output is, we simply divide it by the square of the gain and we're there. The input referred noise current is a little bit more difficult. Okay. Not, not wildly, but it's a little bit more difficult. All right. So our goal here is to connect our input noise current generator to our noiseless circuit and then force the output noise to be the same. Uh, I know that seems a little weird, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it here, right? So our noiseless circuit is this guy. We apply our noise current, our input refer, input referred noise current. And we determine what our output referred noise voltage will be. And then we're going to wind up setting the output referred noise voltage to be equal to what we determined earlier due to the contribution of the noisy elements and then effectively back calculate what the input referred noise current has to be in order to make that happen. And I know it's a weird methodology, okay? So I'm gonna call this voltage here a noise spectral density Vx squared, so that I can say Vx squared is simply In in squared times the impedance of my capacitor squared, so one over S in quantity squared. Does that make sense? Okay. So why I did that is because transistors do a fantastic job of converting an input voltage to an output signal, right? So I could say pretty easily here that Vn out squared is just Vx squared our voltage gain squared, right? Where the voltage gain is the transfer function of the circuit. So that's going to be 
pi n n squared times one over s c n squared times g m r d squared. And now I can say, oops, went too far. that our output noise voltage that we determined up here for KBT gamma GM plus KGM squared, blah, 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 all multiplied by RD squared. Getting ahead of myself, Rd times Rd squared is equal to In N squared times one over Scn quantity squared times Gm Rd squared, and then solve for what the input referred noise current must be to generate our measured output noise voltage. Uh, that's why it's a little trickier, right? We have to know what the output noise voltage is. And then we have to know what type of signal it would generate in order to figure out what, uh, excuse me, we have to know what the output noise voltage is. We have to know what type of signal the input referred noise current would generate. And then we have to equate the two things. And so using a little bit of algebra here, I'll try to sneak it in right here. I n n squared we would divide both sides by gm squared rd squared right which is going to give us this guy right here. And then we're going to wind up multiplying by S times CN quantity squared. Oops. So we will have S CN squared times 4 KBT gamma, uh, gamma, 4 KBT gamma over GM plus K. Deox WLF plus four KBT over GM squared RD as our input referred noise current. So a couple of things here. All right. Our input refer referred noise current and our input referred noise voltage are almost identical in this case because of the nature of what our input impedance is, right? So it's literally the same thing multiplied by a factor of SCN squared, okay? So what could we say about whether or not the input referred noise voltage and the input referred noise currents were correlated? Well, so obviously the bit here, so this is representing the thermal noise generated by the transistor. And that bit right up there on the left is also representative of the thermal noise generated by the transistor. So I would argue that those two portions are correlated. This bit right here is representative of the flicker noise generated by the transistor. And the same bit is the flicker noise generated by the transistor. Now that portion is correlated. And this guy right here is the thermal noise of the resistor. That guy up there represents the thermal noise of the resistor. That bit's correlated as well. So we can say pretty strongly here that our input referred noise voltage 
and our input referred noise currents are correlated noise sources, okay? The reason why I am bringing that up is because you might be asking yourselves, how are we not counting the noise twice? Because we're putting two noise generators in the system. And that would be a pretty fair and reasonable thing to assume. Um, I don't think we have quite enough time to cover it today. So I will prove to you for an arbitrary input impedance that could be anything from zero to infinity ohms, we are actually counting the noise exactly once when we get back to class on Monday. All right. All right. I will see you guys then.